Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, really appreciate it. Today, the, the goal is to talk about health care, and it's been in the press a little bit less of late. I mean, most of the press headlines are focused on things like ISIS, but in the backdrop of what's going on there, there's some serious um, discussions around what happens around health care, especially in light of the Supreme Court decision around King versus Burwell. So tonight, what we thought we'd do is talk about some key health care topics across the board. And I've some of the panel of experts and folks that have been working with on health care reform here in the state of Michigan for some time now. And uh, just uh, to my right, we've got Tom Valenti of uh, Forthright Health. To his right, we got from uh, Dr. John Blanchard from Premier Private Physicians. we got David Wilson and David Wilson Group next to him. And we've got Dr. Rob Steele. Um, and uh, we've also got with cardiologists and Dr. Uh, Matt McCord, anesthesiologist. And so, um, representing a variety of different groups, including docs for patient care and reform-minded um, healthcare-oriented organizations across the state. And um, the impetus for this discussion, frankly, is, is and, and the timing for it is that early this year, the governor signed into law a um, Public Act 522 of 2014. Um, I know it's 2015, but it was early this year he signed it. So. Um, and what it does is make sure that an innovative form of care that wasn't so innovative 50 years ago, called direct primary care services, was something that could not be treated as an insurance product. And um, simple bill, um, but what it really does is uh, lets doctors know that it's safe to come out in the water and practice medicine the way the old Dr. Marcus Welby used to practice it, and, and, and focus on that relationship between the doctor and the patient once more. Against that backdrop, there's a lot of other considerations that go into the healthcare system that we're going to talk about. Um, but uh, the, the primary focus of today and a lot of the discussion you're going to hear on is uh, how can we reform our healthcare system? How can we um, implement methods and, and systems and models that, that act, and business models that actually do accomplish the stated objectives of the Affordable Care Act, which are to lower the cost of care, to expand access to care, protect consumer choice. Those were the stated objectives. Um, and I think they're noble objectives. I don't think that was the true objective. Um, and so we're going to talk about ways to actually achieve those noble, true, stated objectives. So, and kicking things off here, Kyle, if I um, can help out here and go to the first slide here. Um, when we started this healthcare debate a while back, um, the, uh, we were told that we're going to have that system that could improve the effectiveness of our, of our health care system. We thought it was going to lower costs and improve access to care, and this is what we got instead. And uh, just for reference purposes, um, patients are sitting over in this corner, physicians are sitting over in this corner, there's 159 new organizations sitting in between them. And personally, from my perspective, it's tough for me to uh, be able to make the case in any credible fashion that the addition of 159 new organizations a doctor and a patient is going to lower costs and is going to improve the quality of care for our for our citizens. So we've got a little bit different approach. Pat. Next one, next one here. So we're at this critical juncture right now, and we're starting to talk about what do we deal with? Uh, how, how do we deal with this Affordable Care Act right now? And I'm in that uh, category that suggests that we do need to do something that's more effective for our citizens. And so there's a lot of different ways. You've heard a lot of people talking about. When we started off this whole discussion, when we were talking about health care reform here in the state of Michigan, um, there's a big push to go off and implement every letter of the Affordable Care Act here in the state. That meant that we were going to go off and deploy a state-based health exchange, which we fought. We don't. We're in a federal exchange. That meant that we were going to go off and expand Medicaid, um, which we fought, but it still went forward on it. Um, but uh, the bottom line is we're stuck with a dealing within the confines of the Affordable Care Act. So a lot of people just said, deal with it and let's implement laws to go up and enable it. I'm not in that camp. So then you, if you don't agree with A, you go into the next area, which is um, uh, item B, which is a lot of people are saying just repeal it. Well, um, that sounds good, and, and, except that we don't want to go through the same um, anxiety that we did when this was deployed in the first place. You guys remember the statement saying, if you like your insurance, you can keep your insurance, right? If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Well, I don't want people having to go through the anxiety of finding out that those statements weren't true when we get in the mode of actually um, of repealing the Affordable Care Act. So we've 
got to be responsible on how we go off and do this because people are depending upon many elements of this system for their health care. So then you get into a case where saying, well, okay, repeal it, then replace it. And um, now we're getting into, well, what kind of system do you replace it with? And, and some people are just talking about tweaking it around the edges. And, and uh, um, I actually prefer a different approach. And this is what I, it's called exploit then repeal. So you find those aspects of the Affordable Care Act that embrace free market principles, that allow doctors to practice medicine the way that they, um, that they were trained to practice medicine, and uh, focus in on that doctor-patient relationship where they understand your needs, they can practice preventive care, which keeps you out of the hospital more often. And, and so uh, the nice thing about the exploit then repeal, if we get to the next slide, please, um, first of all, is it recognizes that we're not going to be repealing this for, for two years at the least, at, at the minimum. Um, what we can do is demonstrate something that we haven't demonstrated effectively to date, which led to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, which is jumpstart a free market alternative to it. Um, and so by exploiting what I found as a free market loophole, um, and then uh, we want to make sure we avoid that uncertainty for patients, and then Personally, from my perspective, we saw those 159 organizations on it. It's important that we highlight that those organizations are not needed. They're about control, they're not about care. We're gonna get into that a little bit here. So, next slide, please. And, oh, by the way, maybe when we're all said and done, we can truly achieve those objectives, the stated objectives of the Affordable Care Act. Next slide. All right, so these are the key sections of the Affordable Care Act, and, uh, now that you guys are all settled down, let's go through this page by page, shall we? <laughs> this is the actual HR 3590 in it, and I actually have read this guy, and, and here's your cliff notes. These are the key sections you need to worry about. Number one is 1301, 1302, and uh, those are the areas that deal with what's called a qualified health plan. And the reason qualified health plan is important is that's what keeps the IRS from knocking on your door saying you're not in compliance. It has to be a qualified health plan. If you don't possess that, you're going to get penalized by the IRS. The other area is highlighted in light blue, factor into this King versus Burwell case before the Supreme Court. Essentially, this premium assistance section references the state-based exchanges, but it does not reference the federal health exchanges. That means that subsidies cannot be offered via these federal exchanges, which Michigan defaults to. And, and we're going to get into what the implications of that are quickly here, but that's a key um, point. But I want to zero in on that free market loophole. When I say exploit then repeal, what do I mean? It focuses in on a late night amendment in section 10,104, in other words, way at the back of this guy, that allows for this innovative uh, service delivery model called direct primary care. If you could just put that somewhere. All right, so that's the section we're going to drill into because it allows these direct primary care models to be included as part of those qualified health plans. And I'm going to go through this very quick tonight. I apologize. And normally this would take a, potentially an hour. I'm going to go through it real quick. Um, so we're going to scoot through and we're going to try to provide as much time for questions and, uh, afterwards here as possible. But if you want to know where the real costs are getting driven in, in healthcare, it's above the fold here. It's this administrative line. And the key word in direct primary care is that it is a direct arrangement between the patient and the doctor. In other words, don't worry about this stuff above the line. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Patient-Centered Care Act, and a lot of people up here are going to be implementing different components of that, of that, um, of that Patient-Centered Care Act in different terms, but they're all working toward that same end of getting rid of that admin layer as much as possible and focusing back on patient care. Next slide. Um, won't go into that in detail, except that keep in mind that under the Affordable Care Act, even if you have these direct primary care services that are found under this free market loophole, you still need catastrophic care so that the superset or the, the combination of both your direct primary care and your, um, your high deductible health insurance for catastrophic care meets all the requirements of a qualified health plan. So direct primary care is only one component. Um, so it's important to know that. All the rest of this stuff is gravy items that makes this proposition even better. Don't have time to go into that in detail tonight. So next, please. Uh, well, one key, like, key facet here, by the way, is that that same model that I talked about for patient-centered care under Obamacare, it doesn't change at all when you get into free market again. Um, all, that, all that's eliminated is the, the need for the IRS to check to make sure whether or not you have, you have met the requirements of a qualified health plan. Next slide. 
Um, I'm not going to get into this slide in detail. Dr. Blanchard is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, next slide. I just want to highlight just quick for reference purposes why we're emphasizing direct primary care and why we're looking at that as a, as a key element of any free market healthcare system in the state. It's because it's been demonstrated that for 20% less cost for employer-based plans, um, you can actually reduce the rate of hospitalization by 50%. So now we're getting in the mode where we can deploy healthcare systems or healthcare solutions that lower the cost of care, but actually improve the quality of that care. And uh, when you get into the Medicaid realm, which is one of the reasons I opposed Medicaid expansion so vociferously, is that it, I thought if we deployed a system that could um, uh, if you deploy this to Medicaid, which they've done in the state of Washington, they demonstrated that you can reduce the, the cost of these programs and providing health care to low-income individuals by as much as 50%, and you still get the reduction in hospitalization that we were talking about as well. And to put that in context, if you click on a couple here, one more. Uh, put that in context, our Medicaid budget now, this is a little outdated, but it's $14 billion. So, 50% off on $14 billion is a pretty good chunk of change. And oh, by the way, this, that's $7 billion. 40% of that comes from the state. That's around $2.8 billion. And we're in the midst of this little debate around road funding. Um, I, want to understand, I want people to understand there are ways of actually freeing up funds from our um, uh, budget that don't involve decreasing uh, services that we have. As a matter of fact, it would improve it in this case. Next slide. Um, these are real. These aren't, these aren't fictitious. The whole concept of direct primary care is not something we dreamed up with pixie dust. They're deploying this in other states very effectively, most notably out in Florida with uh, Epiphany Healthcare. Folks out in uh, Kansas were trendsetters on this with uh, Atlas MD. Dr. Blanchard has been practicing this style of medicine under the moniker of concierge care uh, for quite a while. It's just a different target demographic, but it, we, we're going to demonstrate that it applies to um, uh, low-income brackets as well as high-income brackets. And uh, the state of Washington has been a trailblazer on this as well. They've got um, folks that have been, uh, major uh, companies like Expedia and Comcast are using it in addition to the, to the state government using it for their Medicaid populations. Um, and that's, they started off with 1,000 enrollees in a pilot program that's so successful they, they are now up to 50,000 enrollees. Next slide. So, key enablers, and this is going to be kind of a theme of our discussion tonight, is that if you're going off and rolling out a free market healthcare system, well, you don't start with a whole bunch of mandates from the government. You've got to go off and we're not going to mandate supply, we're not going to mandate demand, but by getting out the word about the potential of this delivery model and the potential of all the, uh, and, and we're highlighting all the enablers that are needed to get this model deployed in the state of Michigan, that's part of the reason why we're having this uh, forum tonight is to make sure we get that word out to people. So whenever you roll out a free market system, you need demand, you need people that are looking for it. We can prime the pump at the state level, the state employees and the Medicaid system we were talking about. You also need supplies. You need trailblazers like Dr. Matt McCord, Dr. Rob Steele, Dr. John Blanchard, and David and Tom that are going off there and starting to get the network of providers rolled out here in the state. And there's some other things that we need that, are in place, that we can put in place, things like descoped insurance for that catastrophic element that don't include primary care anymore. Um, so you don't overlap and duplicate services. And then the concept of private exchanges. Exchange isn't a four-letter word. Government on exchange is a four-letter word. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to get out. Um, and I know it's not four letters. Uh, all right, next <laughs> So state strategies. That we've got. Um, first of all, we've done the first first part of this, and that's uh, defining DTS as non-insurance product. By the way, now that Michigan's done it, we also have uh, similar legislation being promoted now in Kansas, and uh, uh, Utah has been ahead of the curve for a while on it, but Montana, Idaho, um, and Florida, and uh, quite a few other states. So I went out to conference in Dallas in in, uh, in the fall and started rolling this out. It started to pick up steam. Um, the other thing you can do is start priming the pump on the demand, which is getting government employees in it, getting Medicaid um, into it, and then a couple of the other elements that are kind of the gravy elements on this plan that I don't have time to go into tonight, but that can really help enhance the value proposition. Next slide. Federal level, we've got a Senate concurrent resolution that's asking the federal government to implement these four strategies at the federal level that would help us expand the direct primary care market 
here in uh, Michigan. And that means simple things like uh, um, allowing us to go off and, and use direct primary care services in context of Medicaid, allowing it for Medicare as well, because a lot of patients are tied at the hip when it comes to CMS for Medicare and Medicaid, and then allow direct primary care payments to be paid out of a health savings account. So right now there's restrictions on it that make this less than attractive at times. So next slide. Uh, judicial strategy, I mean, this is just highlighting, if you could just click through on this. Um, by going to, by sticking with the federal exchange, Michigan may have a get out of Obamacare free card, and that's at King versus Burwell. If it's ruled in, in uh, favor of the plaintiff in June, um, we will no longer be able to offer subsidies on the federal exchange. On the surface, that sounds cruel and inhumane, because now people can't afford their health care, but when you read further in the Affordable Care Act, there's a section 5000A that says that if people cannot uh, afford, or if people have to pay more than 8% of their personal household income to buy a plan that meets the, meet the requirements of the Qualified Health Plan, they are not subject to the mandate, which means we can get back into free market mode for everybody pretty much that, that makes $200,000 or less will no longer be subject to the mandate. Um, so this is a big deal. We've essentially gotten out of the requirement to comply with the Affordable Care Act for most of our citizens. And that's kind of a big deal. Um, so that's why I call it the Get Out of Obamacare Free Card. But you have to, uh, you have to stick with the federal exchange. So, because um, everybody's going to have to pay market rates now if they have to pay subsidies. And you won't find market rates on the insurance plans in the environment of Obamacare right now that you can afford for 8% of your personal income unless you, you're breaking in some serious cash. So next slide. So just to recap, these are the different options that are out there. I believe that the way we should be proceeding here is where we've got a free market loophole, which allows us to actually um, conduct our business as responsible citizens, as healthcare professionals. The, the one area of the law that carves out a niche that says, go ahead and do what doctors are supposed to, are, are, are trained to go off and do, that's the area we want to exploit. And by the time we've exploited that and created a footprint, a free market footprint for this model here in the state of Michigan, when they go off and repeal it and eliminate those 159 organizations between a doctor and a patient, that our citizens that depend on good quality health care will not have any adverse impacts. That's the goal of this strategy. So um, after all, I believe that that 159 organization, you click the last slide here, my big problem, after reading through this and you read through all the statements and all the things that you can't do, the things that you must do across the board, I'm adamant in my um, position that Obamacare is not about care, it's about control. And that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate in opposition against it. And, um, and we've got a lot of folks here tonight that can provide a lot more um, uh, insights as to the execution of healthcare in today's uh, uh, healthcare system that I think you'll find valuable. So um, without further ado here, I think we're gonna, we've talked a lot about this buzzword, direct primary care. I can't think of a better person to come out here and talk to you about direct primary care because he's lived it, and that's uh, Dr. John Blanchard. So he can. I don't feel so much like a nut anymore. Uh, back in 2001, uh, people called me that and a few other things. Uh, when we came up with this idea that we could reinvent the delivery of primary care in our country, reinvent its delivery and reinvent its finance. And uh, we came up with this model of direct primary care as a methodology to do that. I think sometimes, I don't know about you guys, but when I watch the news and I, I hear people talking and talking and talking and talking about health care, uh, it gets more and more complicated. It seems like this is just such a complicated topic. And so I think for me, it's easy to think about it in more simple terms. Uh, so let's try to, I'm gonna spend the next 10 minutes just trying to simplify, okay? So for a, a highly functional healthcare system, we need three things, in my view. We need three things. We need to have people be able to have access to the catastrophic things that happen to us. Uh, we need to have access to <coughs> coverage for that. Things like going to the emergency room, going to the hospital, having surgery, catastrophic, financially <coughs> catastrophic events that happen infrequently. So we need that. We need access to primary care. You know, in healthcare, access is everything. So we need the, the access to coverage for those catastrophic things. 
we need access to primary care. Uh, study after study shows that wherever you have a high concentration of primary care in the community, health care costs go down, quality goes up, and service goes up. Uh, so, and the third thing is we need access to a relationship with a doctor, specifically a primary care doctor. Those are the three elements that, in my view, we need if we wanted to simplify our healthcare system and make it more responsive to our needs, okay? So let's start with the first one. We're gonna start with access to uh, these catastrophic and frequent events. <clears throat> Think of direct primary care as sort of uh, your car. You have insurance for your car that covers getting in a car accident and, uh, and you know, it's a catastrophic rare event. Well, primary care is a low cost frequent event. By definition, it's not insurance. By definition, insurance is something that covers financially catastrophic things that happen infrequently. So we pay for that and we get coverage. So direct primary care, primary care in general, is sort of like when you have your car and you get tune-ups and you get oil changes and you get brakes and you're able to shop in the marketplace to get the best quality and the best price. Um, that's the way we think direct primary care should work. We should have health insurance for the catastrophic things and buy directly from the provider our primary care services. Because 40% of every dollar that we're spending in healthcare is going to adjudicate claims and going to the Blue Cross and, and the system, this system, why, why aren't we buying our, direct, our care directly from the provider, the primary care? The, we also need, uh, within a system like that, we need a guide, right? We need to make sure that you're seeing a professional that makes sure that the right people are getting the right care at the right time and place, right? So we need access to primary care to a professional who can help to be that guide for us to make sure that we do get the care that we need and, and in the right way so that people aren't ending up in the emergency room for, you know, uh, uh, cold and, and bronchitis and those sort of things. Those are the things that are dri driving up the cost of health. Um, and again, overutilization of these very expensive things that are, are provided. You know, healthcare is not a limitless resource. You know, it's it's a limited resource that's that's very expensive, and we need to treat it that way. And that's why we need to have somebody to help <coughs> us to make sure that we're receiving the care the way that we should be receiving. Now, the question is, do you want that guide to be the federal government, or do you want that guide to be a trusted? Physician that you have a relationship with. And that's what we advocate for, that, that it's the physician that can best help uh, direct your care. So that's the, the first thing. Um, the second thing is that we need access to primary care, right? We need a functional primary care office that we can have access to. And the you may have heard of this uh, called the Patient Center on Home being promoted by Blue Cross and other insurances around the country as the solution for lowering health care costs and improving quality and improving service, the so-called triple A. Uh, the problem is that the patient center medical home was built to fail. It was built to fail. And the insurance company, insurance, uh, the government uh, from the beginning have, have, what have they ever done right when it comes to health care? Okay. And, and so there's no, no doubt in my mind that the patient center medical home is going to fail. I'm going to tell you why. For, uh, to deliver a patient center medical home, it costs about $80 per patient per month. $80 to $100 per patient per month. There's 140 different elements of the patient center medical home. These things have to do with uh, population management and technology and reaching out to patients and getting them in to the office and really managing groups of patients. Uh, and so you would think that you know, with, with adding all of this infrastructure that needs to be added into a primary care doctor's office that you would be paid for that, right? Well, of all the elements, you know, you get a 60-page book that you, you need to follow in order to qualify as a patient's care medical home under the cross. 
we, we know because we have a traditional practice and we went through that process um, in addition to our drug practice. And what they end up doing is, whereas before there was 100% of your reimbursement was fee-for-service, so-called fee-for-service, you know, when you see a, a patient, you get paid for that visit. Um, and now they've started adding incentive number, dollars. Now, do you think they added the incentive dollars on top of what we're getting paid? No. What they've done is they've reduced the fee-for-service amount that you're paid, and then they give you an incentive dollar. So if you were to annualize, for an average primary care doctor, if you were to analyze their full payment for fee-for-service and for uh, the um, incentive money that they get, it works out to be about $20 per patient per month. And that's what we were getting paid under the fee-for-service system. Okay? So you'll never be able to deliver a patient-centered medical home uh, with, for that amount because it costs five times that to deliver it. So the, remember, primary care is a business, right? So you can't provide something that you're not getting paid for. So this is, the, this is what I tell everybody, okay? So Blue Cross is saying, I'll tell you what, doctors, you pretend to deliver a patient-centered medical home and we'll pretend to pay for it. That's the way the system works, okay? We deliver a real patient-centered medical home because we work for our patients. So let's go to the last piece. We need access to a primary care physician that we have a relationship with, okay? You can't arrive at high-quality, cost-effective health care, okay, the, the triple aim. You can't increase quality, increase service, and decrease cost without a relationship with your primary care physician. And a relationship, for you to have a relationship, it first starts with time. Time is the currency of excellence. If you're going to be excellent at anything, you have to spend time on it. And for a doctor, that means spending time with their patient. And not only are you not having time with your doctor, your primary care doctor, but now you can't even see them most of the time. You can't call them, you can't you know, get in touch with them. So time leads to communication. Communication is the foundation of how we arrive at a true diagnosis and true treatment plan in primary care. You talk to any doctor and they will tell you that they pretty much know what's going on before they do their exam and labs and diagnostic tests. We only use those things to narrow down a differential diagnosis the truth, the true diagnosis, the true treatment plan. But that takes communication. You can't communicate if you don't see your doctor. You can't communicate if you're not having time with your doctor to communicate. Time communication leads to relationship. It's based on trust. If that, if that relationship isn't there, you'll never engage the patient in the ownership of their own health and wellness and help them to arrive at optimal health in their lives. That's what people and we need to do it in such a way that the doctor has a, a limited number of patients that, that they can take care of. Now we think it's about around uh, 1,000 patients if it's with a doctor and a nurse practitioner or a PA managing that group of patients. And then we do population management and, uh, and stratifying care and taking care of them. So for all of this to happen, I'm going to wrap it up here and, and, uh, and I'll be open for questions at the end. But um, for this direct primary care model to really begin to start scaling in Michigan, we need to have two elements that have to come together. We need to have either Medicaid and Medicare or private insurance work with us to create an insurance product that covers that catastrophic stuff and wraps around a direct practice. And or we need employers getting engaged to say that, yeah, we want to hire these guys to take care of our employees because we know that they're going to ultimately lower healthcare costs for us, because we do. We have, our data shows that we have one-fifth the hospitalization that a traditional doctor's office has. Uh, we have about a thousand patients now, and I'll make the announcement here, we haven't done the official press release, but we just signed an affiliation agreement with Henry Ford Hospital to scale direct practice in Michigan. So they, they really believe in this model, and they're going to be Remember, if it's red, it's on. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Blanchard. I really appreciate it. Now we're going to segue over into Dr. Matt McCord, who's been a trailblazer with uh, doctor patient care here for quite a while. And 
on free market 